Welcome back to the Jake Beckett Show podcast. I'm your host, Jake Beckett, back in the house for another tremendous episode. Um, we are continuing with our Great Men of History series. This is part two of George Washington, the father of our country, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. Uh, we left off last time uh, just as Washington was nominated and confirmed as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army at the Second Continental Congress in the summer of 1775. Just a brief recap, uh, we went through in episode one. If you haven't watched that yet, go back and uh, recap episode one. But just to, just to briefly uh, uh, re recapture where we are right now, uh, Washington was born in Colonial Virginia, 1732. Uh, we talked about his upbringing, his uh, tough uh, childhood, uh, relationship with his older uh, half-brother, Lawrence Washington, his service in the French and Indian War, uh, his, his emergence as a young, brave war hero, his service in the colonial legislature, the Virginia House of Burgesses. Uh, we went through his time as a planter, his marriage to the widow Martha Custis, um, his, his time as a, as, a, as a member of the Virginia colonial elite, uh, and then we, as we left off, we, we talked about the rising tensions between crown and colonies, uh, the economic and political disturbances that were eventually to erupt in the American Revolution, and Washington's attendance at the First Continental Congress in 1774, and then, of course, the outbreak of the war uh, with the First Battle of Lexington and Concord in April 1775. So as we left off, Washington was just confirmed as commander-in-chief, and he took control of the army uh, at the siege of Boston in the summer of 1775. And so, as we, as we mentioned before, uh, the British had been driven uh, back into the city of Boston um, after the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Um, there was a, a major battle at Bunker Hill. If you've never been to Boston, I recommend go checking that out. Uh, pretty cool scenery there. Uh, visited that several times when I lived in Boston. Um, and then, so Washington, when he, when he arrived, um, you know, there was a pretty substantial force there. It was nearly 20,000 men, uh, according to contemporary sources, a massive force, um, considering the population of the colonies was just about 3 million uh, at the time, which is the current population of the state of Arkansas. Uh, kind of ironic that we're still trying to use the same government, the same system of government uh, to govern 350 million people as originally governed about 3 million uh, but anyway, we'll get to that. Um, so Washington, as he arrived to take command, um, you know, he was he was presented with this uh, kind of hard scrabble ragtag force. Uh, we have it's really important for us to note this entire you know a lot of modern historians and modern people they make the mistake of projecting our understanding of modern America uh, onto colonial America, the early you know American colonies, which truly were thirteen very independent colonies and states that really, they, the only common cause they had was an enemy in, in the British crown. Um, you know, the, a lot of the troops under Washington's command were more loyal to their colonies, to their colonial commanders, uh, to their homes. And, and Washington, he, he immediately realized um, that he had to instill discipline in these troops. And he was a disciplinarian. Uh, you know, Washington was not necessarily loved by his troops uh, because of this. You know, he was very free with the death penalty. Uh, he was very free with flogging his troops. He, he realized that, you know, if they were going to have any chance in fighting this ultimate professional force, um, you know, they were going to have to create a professional force of their own. And, and that's really what he sought out to do. And I, as I've demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate over this podcast series, you know, Washington's real genius was not really tactical battlefield command. Uh, his real genius was in leadership uh, and, and presence and cobbling together, being the indispensable man that, that held this fledgling revolution, this fledgling army together. Um, but the siege of Boston went pretty well, um, you know, uh, especially after uh, Henry Knox, uh, one of Washington's uh, subordinates and confidants, uh, underwent a, a tremendous, amazing expedition to uh, transfer cannon and art artillery that were captured uh, at Fort Ticonderoga in northern uh, northwestern New York State, in the dead of winter, uh, he used sleds and all kinds of ingenious mechanisms to transfer these cannon 
from New York over to Boston. If you've ever spent a winter uh, in New England, you, I mean, you, you can imagine what he was dealing with, but he did it. And Washington devised this pretty ingenious um, this pretty ingenious plan uh, where he had his engineers build a bunch of breastworks and fortifications that he then moved uh, under cover of night very, very close to uh, the city of Boston. And so really the British, they woke up one morning and they saw all these cannon pointed at them and they realized their situation was hopeless. And so then in March, um, you know, that's when um, uh, Boston uh, was beginning to be evacuated. So um, it was a huge, it was a huge victory uh, for the for the the early uh, American colonies. Um, that the victory at Boston sent just this shock wave of optimism throughout colonial America. Um, they thought this could be the end of the war. Um, they thought they were invincible. They could defeat the British, and you know that's really what motivated the Second Continental Congress to declare independence, which they did, obviously on July the fourth, seventeen seventy six. But Washington knew better. Uh, he knew the British. He knew their pride, he knew their commanders, um, and he had a pretty good idea of, of what would happen next. Uh, he knew that New York City w was the inevitable target um, of the British. It was a you know, major, important port city. Um, there was a lot of loyalist sentiment there, and he had a, a good idea that's where the next attack would come, and he was right. So Washington, he moved his headquarters down to New York City on Manhattan Island, uh, and he prepared for the defense of New York. Um, but let's let's just pause there and, and, and talk about this for a second, because really this was Washington's, one of his major uh, tactical and strategic blunders of the war uh, was trying to defend New York, uh, which were, of course, a series of islands, Manhattan and Long Island, when he had no navy. <laughs> it's important to note that the uh, America had no navy at this time. They, they had no navy. They had no ships. Uh, and the British Navy was the finest and largest in the world. And still, Washington decided to stand and fight and try to defend New York City against impossible odds. Really, and as, we'll, as we'll see, the revolution should have ended in New York in 1776. The British should have crushed him there, uh, captured or killed him, but we'll get to that. So Washington, he takes up uh, residence uh, there in downtown New York, uh, and he prepares for the defense uh, to kind of set the scene um, you know, he, there's this amazing gathering on, on you know, in mid-July when uh, they, he received a copy of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you know, he, he gathered his troops there who were, who were there in the city and uh, read out the Declaration to them. It's kind of an amazing, amazing scene. Uh, it must have been very poignant to, to imagine that, to see that, to, to have been there, uh, to hear out the Declaration as it was read uh, to these soldiers who now realize they were fighting for a, a nation. Um, it wasn't just a group of 13 colonies. They were fighting for a, a, na a new nation, a new national identity. Um, and so that's, that kind of sets the scene. And then uh, a few weeks later, the British arrive. And uh, a, a contemporary observer, when, when they saw this massive flotilla arrive with over 10,000 men and hundreds of ships, uh, this man said, it appeared that all of London was afloat. Uh, and that really uh, dampened the mood, as you could imagine, uh, of the Continental Army uh, when they saw this massive flotilla anchored off of Staten Island. So this flotilla, um, so to, to back up, General Thomas Gage was the commander-in-chief of the British forces in Boston. He was fired by King George uh, for his failure there, and he was replaced as commander-in-chief by two brothers, uh, uh, the, the, the brothers Howe, the Howe brothers. Uh, one was a general, and one was an admiral. And they Again, they, the, the British made a, a, they really didn't have the proper mindset. They never did. Uh, and the Howes in particular, the Howes were really unsure if they were leading a conquering force to, to reclaim the colonies or if they were leading kind of a diplomatic effort that was going to end the war by negotiation. Uh, they misjudged the, uh, they misjudged the mentality of, of Congress. They misjudged Washington's mentality. They misjudged the mentality of the people of the American colonies. They thought that there could be a reconciliation uh, between the crown and colonies. But um, you know, if, if you read the writings of the of our founding fathers, they were they were certainly if you read the Declaration, uh, they were certainly prepared to fight to the death. Um, so that was a mistake by the Howe brothers. So they they launched this amphibious invasion uh, of Long Island uh, in August 1776 and. Um, you can read more about this battle. Uh, again, uh, my, my two major points of reference are uh, two great biographies of Washington, Washington Alive by Ron Chernow and uh, His Excellency George Washington by Joseph Ellis. 
Um, it, there was a, a brilliant flanking maneuver performed by the British. They landed at Long Island, uh, kind of modern-day Brooklyn. They did this flanking maneuver from south to east and then up to the north and west and completely outfoxed Washington. Um, and you know, Henry Clinton was the uh, subordinate commander to the, to, to the Howe brothers, and he was uh, vigorously urging them to, to just simply thrust forward uh, and drive Washington into the East River. But crucially, on the night of the, of the original invasion, they did not. They halted and allowed Washington to escape across the East River um, back into New York. That was kind of a theme of the Revolutionary War was Washington leading these river crossings, as we'll see. So Washington was by no means um, safe at that point. Uh, he was forced to abandon New York, and he retreated up uh, Manhattan Island, through the Bronx, through modern-day Harlem, up to White Plains. He fought a major battle at White Plains. Uh, it was said by some of his staff that Washington um, was trying to get himself killed. Uh, he was taking extremely reckless uh, risks with his own personal safety, uh, particularly at the Battle of White Plains. Um, it, it's it's, it's e pretty easy to imagine Washington kind of seeing himself going down in this blaze of glory as he thought the revolution might have been lost. Um, but it wasn't. Um, and, it, but, and it really showed Washington's ruthlessness uh, that he was willing to burn New York to the ground upon his retreat, which he did. Uh, you know, there were fires that were set. Washington always denied it, but, you know, really it, it, it's pretty clear that um, they burned New York uh, upon their exit as they knew the British were about to take control. Um, Washington then conducted really the, the, the end of 1776 was this long fighting retreat south. Uh, many troops were captured at the losses of Forts Washington and Fort Lee, named after one of uh, Washington's subordinates, Charles Lee, uh, who had been a British officer. Um, and, and so Washington eventually, he escapes down through New Jersey and crossed the Delaware River uh, into Pennsylvania. And at this point, uh, December 1776 was really the low point of the revolution. Um, it, it was really generally considered that the revolution was over. Uh, Washington had lost about half of his force. He was down to 10,000 men. And about half of those troops, their enlistments were about to expire at the end of 1776 because they had enlistments with their various uh, colonial, at that point, state militias. Um, and Washington really, it, it was desperate. And so he decided on Christmas night to embark upon this, this, this wild gamble um, to cross the Delaware River at night uh, and surprise the Hessian forces that were at Trenton and then the British forces that were at Princeton uh, about 10 miles away. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, it's immortalized in the famous painting, Washington Crossing the Delaware. Uh, and it truly, really captures, I think that it's one of my favorite paintings of all time. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, everyone knows this painting. But I think it really captures the essence of Washington leading from the front uh, at the head of his troops in the cold, in the, in the freezing river. And they were able to cross and they defeated the British uh, at, at Trenton and Princeton and the Hessians at, at Trenton in particular. Uh, and those were two great victories that really, um, you know, saved the revolution, uh, to put it bluntly. Um, and, and Washington was able to set up winter quarters in New Jersey, crucially. Uh, they kept that foothold in New Jersey. Um, and, and Washington was able to, he was able to keep his army intact uh, throughout the winter of 1777. Um, and th then we, 1777 was really, um, it was the turning point year of the American Revolution. Uh, it got off to a bad start in early 1777 in the summer. Um, it, but first, let's, let's back up. So the British at this point, they really had a decision to make. Um, you know, there was a, they were headquartered in New York, uh, where they stayed uh, really until the, the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783. Uh, it was kind of an embarrassment for the Americans that uh, the British, were, they were never driven out of New York, uh, despite Washington's best efforts. Um, but they really had, the, the Howes had a decision to make. Um, they could either join up with uh, uh, the army under the command of John Burgoyne, uh, which was then operating in northern New York, um, or they could have uh, launched a kind of a pincer attack on Philadelphia, which was then the Patriot capital, um, and try to fight this two-front war. Uh, they violated a major principle of, of, of military tactics and strategy, uh, which is unification of forces, and they decided against helping Burgoyne in the north uh, and decided to concentrate on capturing the rebel capital at Philadelphia, which they did uh, after the Battle of Brandywine. Washington was outflanked at Brandywine by the Howes and Clinton, um, and the, the Americans were driven from their capital. Uh, Philadelphia was captured in mid-1777. But crucially, the turning point of the war came at the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. 
that is when um, the, the, the British were defeated uh, by a combined force under Horatio Gates uh, and Benedict Arnold, uh, who was, uh, up until the moment of his betrayal, he was the best battlefield commander that the Continental, Continental Army had. Um, and he, uh, they were able to force Burgoyne to surrender, and he surrendered nearly 10,000 British troops uh, at Saratoga in October 1777. And this is important for two reasons. Number one, it saved Washington. Uh, at that point, there was, uh, there was a big movement in Congress uh, and among some of his generals, like General Conway and General Gates and General Lee. Uh, they wanted to replace Washington. They thought he was a bad commander. They thought that he um, you know, was costing them uh, after, after uh, the Battle of Long Island, New York, and the Battle of uh, White Plains and the loss of the forts and then the loss of the capital after Brandywine. There was a big movement to have him replaced. But the victory at Saratoga uh, saved Washington's command. Uh, but even more importantly than that, it finally convinced the French to come into the war uh, in support of America. And this is crucial because it's very, it's very important for us to understand that victory against the British w would never have been possible without French support. Um, they, they ended up supplying uh, the Continentals with about 10,000 troops. And crucially, they supplied the Continentals with a navy. Uh, again, the Americans had no navy, the British had the best navy in the world, and if they were ever going to win the revolution, they had to conclude peace with France, uh, or a, a treaty of alliance with France, and they did. The Marquis de Lafayette was crucial to this, um, and, and really, I mean, this was the mistake, one of the mistakes made uh, by the Confederacy in the American Civil War about 80 years later, um, was that you know the, 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 the South, the Confederacy, never... Uh, achieved an alliance with Britain or France, which they needed to do to defeat the North. Uh, but that's you know, maybe that's a topic for another podcast. But uh, the Battle of Saratoga finally convinced uh, uh, King Louis and the court at Versailles to support uh, the American Revolution, which they did, and that really that really transformed the war. Um, at this point, um, the Americans, um, Washington, decided on on a new strategy. Um, you know, the, w with the help of Baron von Steuben, a, a, a Prussian uh, general of, of kind of ambiguous origins, this guy showed up kind of out of nowhere um, and impressed Washington with his military prowess. Uh, the Prussians uh, were, were generally considered the finest troops uh, in, in Europe, um, you know, the, kind of the, leg le the legacy of Frederick the Great. Um, and, and Baron von Steuben helped Washington transform uh, the, the Continental Army from this ragtag group of farmers with pitchforks into a pretty professional force. And it was kind of ironic that, um, you know, after Valley Forge uh, into 1778, this was when the American Army uh, really became a true professional fighting force. But it's ironic because uh, Washington's strategy really changed. Uh, he realized that at this point, now that the French were involved in the war, it was only a matter of time until the Americans won. So really all they had to do in Washington's mind, which was correct, was generally avoid a major catastrophic battle. And so what, what really happened over the next few years, the next three years uh, until Yorktown in 1781, it was really Washington just kind of keeping the army together, uh, avoiding major conflicts, uh, and just kind of picking his spots while the British were flailing around and trying to force the Americans into a decisive victory where Washington could be captured or killed. Uh, and Washington was, he, he was brilliant in that regard, uh, that he realized his own limitations, he realized um, that time was on his side, and as long as they just kind of extended this rebellion, extended the war, um, they would eventually win. And, and of course, he was proven right. So in, in the spring of 1778, uh, King George III fired the Howe brothers. Uh, they were relieved of command. Uh, and in their place was General Henry Clinton, uh, who was probably the best battlefield commander that the British had. Um, he Again, he was the one who was urging the Howes to crush Washington at the Battle of New York. He was urging the Howes to crush Washington uh, at, at White Plains. Uh, he was the one uh, urging them to crush Washington uh, at, before he crossed the Delaware. He was ignored until it was kind of too late. Uh, but he, he took command and he was more aggressive. Um, and before I forget, just kind of going back to just a, a really great anecdote uh, at the Battle of New York. So uh, I, 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 I share this anecdote because I think it really goes back to just it displays like really Washington's value uh, to, to the army. So 
when the British, when they were, you know, when they arrived uh, off Staten Island, they sent a uh, an officer um, to to present the uh, the offer of the Howe brothers um, to kind of end the war and bring the Continentals back into the fold. Um, and this this man was he was he was blindfolded and he was brought to Washington's headquarters. And when he took his blindfold off, he saw Washington for the first time. And, and he saw Washington and all of his battlefield regalia. He saw him with his staff and his presence. And he said that, that like it, everyone who was there just commented on how just, just awestruck this, this British officer was at seeing Washington. And he saw just how, how, lar- how physically imposing he was. He saw how intelligent and well-spoken he was. Um, and, and that was not lost on, on the British officers who dealt with him. And they, they saw that Washington was the key man. Uh, and it was, a, it was a real test. And it really showed, it showed Washington's own men, uh, hey, this, was, this is the man. You know, this is the guy. This is the force to be reckoned with. Uh, even this British officer, who's who's you know part of the greatest military in the world at the time, you know either you know one two with the French, you know even he saw you know how intimidating Washington was. So that was a crucial aspect. So anyway, fa- you know back to 1778. So Washington, 1778 and 79 were kind of a quiet period uh, in the war. Uh, it, it, the war kind of uh, devolved into the stalemate. Uh, once the French uh, came into alliance with the Americans, the British evacuated Philadelphia. Washington took back Philadelphia. Uh, he put Bennett Darnold there. Um, and, and the British were back in New York, where they would, would remain until 1783. And so for the next two years, uh, it was pretty quiet as both sides were kind of figuring out what to do. Um, uh, pr- the, the major event that took place over these two years was the uh, the defection, the treason of Benedict Arnold. Um, he was... Uh, he was transferred from Philadelphia to West Point, uh, where there was an American fort, uh, and he um, he was he, he became in contact with uh, John Andre, who was the head of British intelligence in America, and uh, you know he decided to defect to the British, uh, and he was given a command of British troops. Uh, it was a big blow uh, to the Continentals, to the cause. Uh, obviously, Benedict Arnold's name has lived in infamy, but it is important to note that Arnold was he was the best battlefield commander the Americans had. He was the real victor of Saratoga. Um, and, and it was really a shame that he decided to, to trade his honor and, and live in infamy uh, you know, to commit treason against the American cause. But he did. Um, and so in 1780, Clinton decided on a new strategy. Uh, he realized the war was going poorly in the North, um, and he realized that there, w- there was more loyalist sentiment in the South uh, due to their close connection uh, economically with Britain and trade and, and cotton and tobacco and all that. Uh, and so he decided on a major invasion of, of South Carolina, uh, of Charleston, which at, at that time it was called Charlestown, South Carolina. Uh, he made an amphibious invasion in uh, 1780 of Charlestown. Uh, he, ca- he captured a major uh, continental garrison that was there. Uh, seven or 8,000 troops were, were captured by the British. Um, and then Clinton, crucially, he decided to return to New York, and he left in command General Cornwallis, uh, who was his number one subordinate. Uh, and Clinton, uh, at that point, he he was kind of a manager of the war from New York. It was a mistake, which, which was a mistake, as we'll see, because Clinton, uh, he was a good commander. He was aggressive. Uh, he he knew what had to be done. Um, but really, you know, crucially, he decided um, to not take battlefield command in South Carolina, uh, and instead decided to remain in New York. So Cornwallis um, decides to continue fighting in South Carolina. He captures Charlestown. And he starts to go north. And by then, the British strategy was to have Charles uh, uh, Cornwallis uh, lead a, a force from the south to the north, where they would link up with the uh, British forces in New York under Clinton and then destroy Washington together. Um, but they were, you know, Cornwallis obviously never made it uh, much further than southern Virginia. Um, he had a major victory over Horatio Gates, the Battle of Camden. Um, and then that's when Gates was fired and replaced with uh, Washington's preferred general, Nathaniel Green, who was actually a very, very good battlefield commander because Green understood that you were never going to be able to go toe-to-toe with Redcoats in an open field. They, they were just too good. They were too talented. Uh, the Continentals were too raw. There was too much militia. Um, and it really, it, it's, it's really captured beautifully um, in the, the Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot, um, you know, their, their new strategy, um, which was to undertake a guerrilla campaign uh, led by people like Francis Mary and the Swamp Fox, who Mel Gibson plays in The Patriot. Uh, they, they really did a good job of capturing how they were able to, to harass and, and just kind of plague this British effort 
uh, down in, in the Carolinas and in Virginia. And so in 1781, um, 1781 was, was the decisive uh, point in ending the war. So in 1781, um, um, well, well, first, I, I, Benedict Arnold, uh, he was given command of a, of a loyalist battalion, and he went on this raiding party up into uh, the Tidewater area of, of Virginia uh, and burned several homes there on the Virginia coast, uh, very close to Mount Vernon. And a great anecdote that I love to share, just uh, again, it kind of goes back to Washington's character. Um, you know, Mount Vernon was, was his home, uh, as we described in, in the first episode. Uh, he, he really uh, took a lot of pride in Mount Vernon. He built it up. Um, I recommend everyone go visit Mount Vernon if you never have before. Uh, the house is, is wonderfully preserved. There's a great modern museum on the property as well. Um, they give a military discount for all the veterans out there listening. So anyway, go visit Mount Vernon. Um, but Washington got a letter. Um, from his caretaker at, at Mount Vernon um, and, and said, hey, uh, there's British raiding parties uh, burning um, uh, manor homes up and down uh, the Virginia coast. You know, what do you want me to do if the British uh, come close to Mount Vernon? And, and this is where Washington's character is truly revealed. Washington wrote his caretaker and said, if the British come anywhere close to Mount Vernon, I want you to burn it to the ground. I'd rather see it as a heap of ash than in the hands of the British. And so that, I mean, that, that really, in my mind, that really encapsulates Washington's mentality, uh, his character. He was not doing this to enrich himself. He was quite willing to burn everything that he owned on this earth, up, in, uh, up to and including Mount Vernon, his estate, um, if it would preserve the war effort. And he did not want anyone to get the appearance um, that he was in it for himself, or he was just trying to protect his own property and his own estates. He told his caretaker, if the British come close, burn Mount Vernon to the ground. So that was, I mean, that was how dedicated Washington was to the cause. Uh, in any case, uh, they did not have to burn Mount Vernon. Washington decided, uh, even though he was itching to attack the British in New York and drive them from New York, um, you know, the, the, the French under uh, Rochambeau, and Lafayette convinced Washington uh, to embark upon this southern strategy. Uh, what they convinced him to do was kind of launch this amphibious invasion where Washington would lead his army south, uh, and the French Navy would attack the British Navy outside of Virginia, where Cornwallis was holed up at Yorktown. So Cornwallis made a crucial uh, blunder here at Yorktown. Uh, he felt that he was protected, but really what he was doing was he was marching his army into a death trap. Because when the French Navy defeated the British Navy off the coast of Virginia, then the French were able to blockade Cornwallis at Yorktown. And then Washington, in uh, September and into October, uh, he began to besiege Cornwallis' forces outside of Yorktown, uh, and then finally forced Cornwallis to surrender on October 16, 1781. And that was at the famous scene where um, you know, the, the, British, uh, the British band uh, allegedly played the world turned upside down, where they had to surrender to Washington. And this was the major, uh, the last major uh, battle of the war. Uh, Cornwallis uh, surrendered to Washington. He surrendered uh, the uh, British Army in the South. Um, and then at that point, uh, all that was left was Clinton and his forces in New York and the British Navy. Um, and that, when, when news of Yorktown uh, reached the British Parliament uh, in early 1782, uh, that was when uh, King George III and his minister, Lord North, that was when they finally um, realized that the, the revolution was going to be successful, um, that it was time to conclude peace uh, with the Americans and with the French, um, and it was time, at least for the time being, uh, to allow the Americans to have independence. Uh, and that's what happened. Um, the British realized that uh, the war was hopeless at that point. Um, obviously, uh, they did not uh, they did not totally give up on reconquering the colonies um, until after the War of 1812. Um, but at that point, they realized uh, that the war was over, and they entered peace negotiations with Benjamin Franklin uh, and Adams and Jefferson. Well, no, actually, Adams was in Amsterdam. Uh, Jefferson and Franklin uh, were, were negotiating peace in France. Um, and so to, to kind of put a bow on this episode and put a bow on, on the revolution— uh, it, it is important to understand um, the, the political situation in 1782, in 1783. So uh, at this point, there was a lot of frustration um, um, among uh, the American, the Continental soldiers in particular. 
Congress was bankrupt. Um, there was a general idea uh, that was kind of building in the colonies that Congress had mismanaged the war, that Washington was the only reason for their success. Uh, there is a lot of truth to that. Um, and a lot of officers, uh, led in particular by uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, who was one of Washington's staffers and one of his young confidants, uh, they wanted uh, Washington to take, take political control. Uh, they wanted him to um, uh, disband Congress, uh, and many wanted him to take the crown and, and, and enthrone himself as king of America. Um, it, it might sound ludicrous at this point, um, uh, in modern America to, to, to think about this, but you have to understand that um, you know, there, there really were no uh, democratic governments really anywhere in the Western world. Um, you know, British, uh, Britain had a, they had a parliament, but they were still uh, very much under the control of, of the crown, of the monarchy. Um, you know, uh, real control in Britain was, was obviously exercised by the prime minister and, and a few ministers, but they were still... Uh, they were still very much under the thumb, under the influence of, of the monarchy, uh, under, King, uh, under King George and his ministers. Um, so it, it would not have been a, a ridiculous idea at all for Washington to uh, simply say, um, you know, hey, I'm, I'm declaring myself king. That would have been a very popular thing to do. Uh, and many people around the world were watching and waiting to see what would happen. But, um, you know, Washington firmly sconched this, uh, what, what is now known as the Newburg Conspiracy um, you know, he, he resigned his commission uh, to Congress. There's a famous painting of, uh, that's in the Capitol Rotunda today of Washington uh, formally resigning his commission, uh, making it known uh, that he had no interest in becoming an American monarch, um, and, and really just kind of uh, reiterating his desire to return home to Mount Vernon. Um, and, and, and like, the, like the, uh, the, uh, the, the famous Roman general Cincinnatus, uh, where the, the city of Cincinnati, uh, where its namesake comes from. Cincinnatus was this Roman general uh, who, who famously, uh, he was a farmer, uh, he was a great military general, and when the Republic was under threat, um, the, the Senate came to him and, hey, uh, Cincinnatus, we need you to, to lead our armies and save the Republic. And then he did, and instead of insul insulting himself as king or emperor of Rome, uh, he, he simply returned to his plow. Uh, and, and uh, resumed the life of a simple farmer. And, and Washington, he was always under this, this kind of enlightenment spell of, of wanting to be the, the, the new modern Cincinnatus. Um, you know, Napoleon, uh, when Washington died in 1799, um, you know, he wrote odes to the American Cincinnatus, uh, Washington. Uh, and, and King George III, when he received the news that Washington resigned his commission, uh, he said he is the most famous man in the world. Um, and and that, that truly, I, I think that... That episode right there, uh, you know, really, really displays Washington's, uh, his mindset, his mentality, um, that he was not interested in becoming um, a king. He was not interested in creating a dynasty. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting uh, and thoughtful thing to, to consider. Um, you know, if Washington, as, as we said before, uh, he had no natural born sons of his own. Um, some people uh, speculate that um, due to the, the smallpox that he contracted uh, as a young man, that he was sterile. Uh, some people say um, that uh, Martha uh, Washington, uh, formerly Martha Custis, uh, that she was barren, uh, that her, her second child from her first husband uh, was kind of a rough pregnancy. Um, and so either whether Washington was sterile or, or whether or not Martha could not have children of her own um, with, with Washington after her second child, uh, whatever it was, um, Washington never had any natural-born heirs, and so it's it, it, it's certainly possible that if Washington had sons of his own, uh, if he was able to to found a dynasty, um, then maybe he would have taken the throne. Maybe he would have taken the crown. Uh, I, I don't think so. You know, Washington was really uh, he was a firm believer in the ideals of Cato uh, from Rome. Uh, you know, Cato was his favorite play. That was kind of the that was kind of the, the big uh, Broadway hit of the time, so to speak. Uh, was the, the play Cato, which kind of lionized uh, this, this, this republicanism, um, you know, this, this, uh, this uh, resolve to fight against tyranny, which was seen, um, you know, uh, in, in the play Cato and kind of in this enlightenment uh, understanding. Caesar was this um, evil dictator, and, and Cato was the, he was the real paladin of Roman liberty. And so I, I really believe, just based on, on, on Washington's upbringing and his writings and the things that influenced him at the time, um, you know, he, he was a true believer in a small-R Republican form of government. Um, and so I, I don't think he ever would have taken the throne, 
But, you know, if he had natural born sons, um, it certainly would have been a great temptation for him uh, to install himself as king and start an American dynasty, a constitutional monarchy of some kind in the mode of Britain. I think that's another reason why that never happened is because it would have been really tough, I think, to sell to the American people that, you know, hey, we just fought this revolution to throw off the yoke of, of the crown. And then Washington, our great Republican hero, uh, it, it would have been somewhat incongruous, uh, 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 just kind of an asymmetrical thing for him to then crown himself as king, even though it would have been popular, uh, even though um, he would have been firmly ensconced on the throne uh, with someone like uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, you know, or, or John Adams being his, his prime minister. Um, but that is not the form of government that he wanted. Uh, he wanted nothing more than to return home to Mount Vernon, uh, to return to his plow, as his great hero Cincinnatus had done in ancient Rome. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. Washington decided to return home to Mount Vernon uh, as the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783. Uh, before that, uh, he, he had this kind of triumphal entry into New York as the British under Clinton evacuated. Uh, they had this massive parade. Um, and, and shortly thereafter, uh, Washington resigned his commission and returned home to Mount Vernon. So that concludes episode two. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this, uh, this narrative of Washington's role as the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. Uh, in the next episode, in the final episode, episode three, I'll detail uh, Washington's role as commander-in-chief uh, as the uh, president of the United States. Uh, he was our first president, obviously. Uh, and we'll go from, from that point, uh, from, we'll go from Mount Vernon in 1783 to the uh, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, uh, then through Washington's presidency, and then his later life, his retirement uh, to Mount Vernon, and then his death in 1799. Uh, so until then, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Like, give us a five-star review. Uh, share this series around uh, if you enjoyed it. Uh, I've been getting some great feedback on this. Uh, people love to hear about Washington. Uh, I, I hope that I'm giving you a new perspective. I hope that you are uh, you know, seeing that you know the, the the founding myths, so to speak, of our uh, of our of our society of our country. Um, you know, they're, they're they're myths for a reason. Um, you know, we we have to believe these ideas that everyone rose up and and we all uh, you know wanted to throw off the yoke of England and uh, there was never a doubt that we were going to you know found a republic. Um, but really, th that never would have been possible uh, without uh, the man uh, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. George Washington. So until next time, uh, this is the Jake Beckett Show, and we'll see you again.